All right, uh, so this is going to be a live episode of the Uncultured Saints podcast. The Uncultured Saints podcast is a poorly listened to thing that we've been doing for a couple of years now. Well, the fact that none of you know what we're talking about. Well, show, the fact that any of that. you are, are here shows that you have no idea what you're in for. Um, are you going to text while we do this? It's my wife. I don't care. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead what? Just keep going. Keep going what? So uh, this is the fourth season of the Uncultured Saints, right? Right. We're going to try and do this uh, video uh, now because I guess that's the, the hipper, cooler things to do and the Utes don't listen to the audio. And that's all the, uh, the previous uh, seasons are. But if you're curious, uh, where can you find the, the three other ones? Uh, iTunes. Okay. We'll there get we them go. up there if they're not up there right now. Uh, but this one will be coming out on YouTube uh, when we finish it. So, you know, that'll be great. Uh, we're going to be tackling something uh, really fun this, uh, this season. We are looking at uh, the Small Called Articles, which is a uh, full-on crotchety, angry old man Luther. A and so, like, usually the, the grumpier the old man, the more I want to listen to it, because, like, this is what I aspire to be. Um, because, like, right now, when I'm grumpy and I'm angry, people just look at me like I'm a bad person. Uh, but when you get to a certain age, it just sort of starts to be expected of you. And that's everything that I want in life. Right, I would yeah. think so. Good, good. Yeah, people ask why we're doing the Book of Concord because that's boring, and it is. It's not. Um, our first season, we started with the formula of Concord. If any of you are, uh, uh, if you know about the Book of Concord, that's the, the most in-depth and uh, most theologically, what? Dense. Dense. So Dense. we were dumb trying to tackle that. Uh, first and foremost. But uh, so that's the first season. Second season's on parables. Third season's on Old Testament and Christ. And then we thought, yeah, let's go boring again and I like go how back you, to the... Are you intentionally trying to drive them away now or are we just lowering expectations <laughs> right. so that when they have to do their evaluations, we might actually get a good all one? Of, all of the above. All of the above. Let's figure out what the small cult articles are other than angry old Luther. What's going on? It's, it's right, well, not right after, but it's, it's in the 1530s, right? Around that time, I don't know exactly when it is. 37. 37 that Luther writes this. This is uh, five, six, seven years after the Augsburg Confession has been written. The Augsburg Confession is that, is that big document, uh, that and the Apology, and the Apology is just an expansion on the Augsburg Confession, that uh, the Lutherans get together and, and present to Rome and present to the Holy Roman Emperor and say, hey, look, this is our doctrine. This is our faith. This is what we believe. Not all of it's different, right? But here it is for everybody to see. We're just putting it out there for everybody to see. And like the part about the Augsburg Confession that was sort of um, interesting was this was when Luther was uh, idealistic enough to think that uh, there could be sort of a healing, that, that everybody who is on different sides between the Roman Catholic Church and those who would become Lutherans, that they could eventually actually uh, be united around the book we swear we believe in. Um, this is the Luther who has resigned himself to the fact that this is not going to happen. Um, and so this is just sort of a last, uh, this is the swan song, because he thinks he's going to die real soon. Yeah. I mean, literally, he's, he's got uh, medical issues, and, and he's just, he's sure he's going to die. And if it's not uh, by natural causes, he's, he's sure that uh, somehow the authorities are going to take him and, and put his life to an end, too. I mean, he's, he's pretty much uh, resigned to the fact that he's, he's done with. Um, it, but it is, it's interesting because you do see, like you said, with the Augsburg Confession and the Apology, you do see uh, Luther and the rest of the reformers with this idea of, no, we're, this is a reformation. We're reforming the church. That's what our whole point is. But it's not a, we're starting a new one. We're not trying to break away. We're just calling uh, attention to the, the ways in which the, uh, the church Catholic has moved itself away, or the Catholic church, excuse me, has moved itself away from what the forefathers uh, of Christianity always believed in. That's why if you ever actually look at the Augsburg Confession uh, and the Apology, a lot of the quotes, you're, you'll wonder why in the world is, is Melanchthon, why are they quoting uh, Augustine all the time and Jerome and doing all of these church fathers that we never care about and never read ourselves. And the reason for that is because uh, the, uh, the reformers are trying to show to Rome and the Pope that, look, this is what has always been. We've all, the church has always believed what we're saying. You guys are the ones who have moved. 
Let's get back to the, to the beginning. Let's get back to what we've always been. Seven years later, Luther's, he's sure that none of that's ever going to work. Right. There's, there's two phone calls that you can make to an ex. Uh, my wife just walked in, so I'm really glad that we can talk about this now. Um, there, there's two phone calls you can make to the ex. The one is when you actually think that there might be a reconciliation. So you're like, hey, remember the good times, you know? Re remember that, that we, we used to like the same things. We had a song. It was great. And there's the other kind. That, that you can make to an ex, where you just want them to know all the reasons why they're awful. And, and yeah, this is that phone call. So uh, hang on for, for this one. Um, as, as Luther writes this, not only is the theology super sharp, and, and I like this because uh, if you want to be a Lutheran, it's going to sound wonderful to you. And if you don't want to be a Lutheran, it's going to be really, really uncomfortable. And uncomfortable is just like, that's my wheelhouse. And so anything that we can do there is going to be great. Uh, but because Luther's just on, he's full on making a call to an ex that he doesn't want to see again. Uh, he's mean. Um, he'll say things like, um, I have decided to publish these articles in plain print in case I should die before there would be a council as I fully expect and hope. Like the idea of him having to go and spend just another minute in a council with these people uh, is actually way worse than death. And so he's like, God, just take me here lest I ever have to see you walking down the other aisle at Target and have to go and like immediately pretend that I need sponges just because I want to get away from here. Right. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, it's so... It's so different than anything else uh, in our confessions. It's also, uh, I'm not sure that, and we'll kind of talk about this a little bit. I, I'm not sure that this is the way in which we should go about uh, uh, proclaiming the faith either to our neighbors down the street. Uh, it's probably not the, the, the best thing that we should do. Well, no, but this wasn't actually made to make friends. This, right. was, this was actually made to defend a, a, a faith. And this is actually one of those things when your faith feels like it's being uh, put on trial, when, when it, it, it feels oppressed, when there's this doubt, uh, the walls that we build in our theology, it actually starts to show why we are the angry Lutheran church. And, and I know that we are the angry Lutheran church. Like, it's, it's one of those really uncomfortable things. Like, it's really weird enough to meet somebody who actually knows what a Lutheran is, but then they have to ask you if they really know what a Lutheran is. Wait, wait, what kind a Lutheran are you? And we, we all, we're the mean kind. Like, you already know, we're, we're, that, we're that one. The walls that we build, they're not actually because we're trying to take the narrow gate and make it narrower. It's because we recognize just how ridiculous the claims that we make are. We believe a dead guy stopped being dead. That's, that's different. We believe that the bread and the wine that the man and the dress hold up in the air is the body and blood of God and we're going to eat and drink it. And that's, that's not only okay for some reason, but it forgives your sins. The, the claims that we make, we recognize that they're, well, I can't by my own reason or strength believe them. I need a Holy Spirit for it. And so when we, we have these, these walls of doctrine that we build, it, it's because we, we, we ourselves are going to be our own worst enemy in abandoning the faith, but the world and the devil won't help. Yeah. No, we always will be. Absolutely. Um, and if, if you do dive in to the Book of Concord on your own, you, and I, we've mentioned this before, but I, I think it's important to see, um, you will see those different documents written for different reasons. Um, and, and you can't just plug them in and the way in which the language is used and the purpose for why they were originally written and plug them in into any and all situations. Obviously, for uh, the small and large catechism, what's the whole purpose of that? Who is Luther uh, writing that to? He's writing that to heads of households. This is how the head of the household should teach their children, right? Uh, and then the large catechism. This is to pastors. This is the way in which pastors should teach the head of the household. So the head of the household can teach their children. When you're looking at the uh, Augsburg Confession, like uh, Pastor Goodman said, this is, <clears throat> this is uh, the, the, uh, the thought of maybe we can once again reform this church. When you go all the way to uh, the Formula of Concord, that's the final book in the Book of, uh, book of Concord. That happens 70 years later, give or take, 50 years later. Um, and that isn't written to the Holy Roman Emperor. That isn't written to, uh, uh, to, to Rome themselves. That's actually written to mostly, mainly, to Lutheran pastors who say, yes, I believe, and holds uh, firm in the Augsburg Confession, but really they don't. What they've done is they're actually walking away and watering down the Confession of Faith. And so the way in which that is spoken is, is going to be different. So I think for us, too, the way in which we're going to speak to different people in our own lives um, and uh, the situations that are placed in front of us, it's not a one-stop shop. Well, but I mean, that's, that's just called not being a jerk. Um, Luther has abandoned that, and that's good for him, and that's sort of why... Uh 
we might be called the mean church. Uh, but there's a difference between helping and winning when it comes to this stuff. Like, it's, it's actually a really important thing. When you actually are, are talking to somebody about the things that are important to you, the things that we believe, there is a difference between helping and winning. Winning is easy. You have the right answers, and so you don't even need to be smart. I'm stupid, and I can do this because I have the right answers right here, and I just have to read them and then say, ha-ha, I win. Um, but that doesn't actually help. Winning is only about you. Helping is actually about your neighbor. And so as we, we go into these things, uh, we're not just simply looking at Luther being a jerk, although that's fun for me as a human being. Uh, we're also looking at some of the pitfalls that sort of come with this. And so uh, in the preface of the, the Small Cold Articles, this is Luther just sort of introducing things. He talks about a couple of things that you maybe want to watch out for. He talks about uh, those scoundrels who run away from the light and avoid the day and are taking pains to delay and prevent this counsel. Um, there's this thing that we do when we don't actually talk about something because we know full well it's not true. We, we wrap it in darkness. Like the scriptures say somewhere in the book there, say what is light to do with darkness? You know, right? That's in there? Somewhere near the back. Somewhere near the back? Okay. Sure. Sure? <laughs> You're not helping. Um, remember when you used to do bits? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I got nothing now. Help me out. I do have a bit. <laughs> oh, no. Do you guys I, want me to ruin uh, Divine Service 1 and 2 for you? I'm super sorry, everybody. Because I was really excited... Uh, that uh, uh, at the end of uh, the, this week together, we get to do divine service setting one. Mm -hmm. um, right? Did I get that right? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so this will forever ruin the divine service setting one for you, and there will probably be snickering and laughing at least from 70 people during confession and absolution. Which so is this the is best, like, oh, okay, I thought time. you were going to ruin it by preaching. No. Um, <laughs> you guys wouldn't have me. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, um, I'm preaching the closing service next week. That's going to be bad now. Okay. So, okay. So, um, have you ever noticed that when we're doing that corporate confession and absolution of the divine service setting one, everybody knows what that is, right? Does anybody ever notice uh, that it sounds as if everybody in the congregation has brought along their own bag of snakes? Does anybody notice that? You're going to be something, you're you, going to do something you weird. Will. I don't like this. No, have you, what is, somebody start doing the, the, the corporate confession. I don't want to. Just say the corporate confession from Divine Service Setting 1. She's got it, she's going to pull it out. Right, yeah. it's the Friday one. The big paragraph that we all start saying. with our whole heart, not loved our neighbors as ourselves, we justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. It's a sanctuary full of snakes. The more people, the worse. It's awful. And you're all going to recognize it now. And you will all laugh. I'm so sorry I brought up bits. Uh, <laughs> Back to you, I Pastor I, a poor Goodman. miserable sinner, confess <laughs> unto you. Um, so, no, what were we talking? I don't like that. You, you, you handed it over to me, man. This was a mistake. Uh, okay, so there is a very simple way to figure out whether or not you're dealing with somebody honest. We shine light on everything. If you're actually inside of the light of Christ, we shine light on everything. And what is light will reflect light and what is darkness will flee. And that means that when we come to this stuff, we, we recognize that this is a big book. And so if you just wanna cherry pick a few lines, you can make it say almost anything you want to. So the question is always, why do you want to say that? Like, let's actually look at it. And most of the time, when we, we sort of twist around the scriptures, when we pick and choose what we're looking at, when we argue against people instead of against truth, because that's a lot of fun to, you know, just find out, well, uh, Pastor Eli Litzow does awful, awful bits, so clearly we should not listen to the theology that he, awful bits. Yes, awful it bits. Uh, <clears throat> see, it's, it's always, what are you trying to hide? When you shine light on everything, the law will make you a sinner. But if you have the gospel, you're not afraid to be called a sinner because you know that Jesus died for you, then you can find shelter in your baptism. Right. Luther wants a confrontation here, not because he thinks he's perfect. In fact, he's well aware that he's not. It's because he thinks that this actually rests on something more than just being right. 
It actually rests on something that can endure a, a, a world that is falling apart because of war and plague and sin and death and evil and all sorts of awful things which sound vaguely familiar. Uh, but right. he actually thinks it stands on Christ and so it will endure. Right. And, and a lot of times we, uh, we think we or we get accused of majoring in the minors and arguing about things that don't matter. And sometimes they don't matter. Um, and sometimes we have to recognize that, right? Within our own congregation, sometimes we don't, we just have to recognize that it doesn't matter whether or not the youth want to paint the youth room or if we're going to get red carpet or blue carpet. Some of those things just don't matter and they're not worth arguing about. But then sometimes things do matter. Uh, and we need, to, uh, we need to speak the truth and purity of the gospel uh, in the light of that specific situation. And then sometimes we do have to have a confrontation like Luther wants here. But we see that in scripture. We see Yahweh having a confrontation with the people uh, that are supposed to be in places of authority and not authority like a, a, an iron fist that they can wield over people, but authority to preach the law and gospel correctly to the people of God so that they may be crushed sinners, but then also so that they may be revived in the gospel. So you'll hear in the Old Testament, uh, and I'm just going to pick out, you'll hear uh, Ezekiel talking a lot about uh, these shepherds uh, who were supposed to be leading uh, the church, supposed to be leading the sheep, uh, but they're not. They're leading them in false doctrine. They're leading them in false worship. And the, the judgment that is going to come upon these shepherds, uh, Ezekiel is saying, is far worse than the judgment that's going to come upon the sheep because the shepherds are leading them, them astray. And Ezekiel isn't coming around trying to be buddy-buddy with these shepherds. He's calling a spade a spade and saying, look, you are called in this most wonderful office and position to proclaim the sweetness of God's uh, gospel to these people, and you're not. You're turning it all into works. You're turning it into something that they have to do. And so Ezekiel's, he's rude with them. Jesus is too, with, with who? Who is Jesus rude with? You. Pharisee, me, yeah, true. But no, Pharisees, Sadducees, chief priests, teachers of the law, the scribes, right? Hardly ever do you see uh, Jesus running around uh, screaming and, 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 and acting like a lunatic uh, to, uh, to the common people. To now, the woman at the well. We got to pause. This is awkward. Well, that's because what Jesus is, is sincerely worried about, uh, deeply offended by, is the same thing that most of us actually carry around all the time. And that's that uh, deep down, we're afraid that our religion is a burden and not a gift. Deep down, we're afraid that this is just one more thing that, that is actually going to make life harder and not easier. Because when we talk about having to live not only under God's law, but more so, when we talk about a God who doesn't just give us things for being good, there's, there's sort of no good within us. There's no way to help ourselves out of this, and that's all we really want. Because I want to be able to look at myself in the mirror and not hate myself, and the law's not good for that. And I really want to be able to figure out how to make God give me stuff, because I want stuff, and the law's real not good for that. And so if all we sort of have is this one thing, what you have is not just sort of like law, bad, gospel, good but a, a Jesus who absolutely will not let this stand on only the law. Because the law, apart from the gospel, will only ever lead you to pride or despair, but it will never lead you to hope or peace. And so when Jesus confronts the Pharisees and chases them with whips and flips the tables, when Ezekiel does all of the wacky stuff that Ezekiel does, uh, it, it's not simply to sort of separate wheat from chaff or pick on rich people or, or well-off people or anything like that. <clears throat> But who he goes after are always those who would take away the cross from sinners. It's always the ones who would let this stand on just you. Because as, as appealing as that sounds, what the law actually shows us is that it's not going to go so well as we think. The law will always make you a sinner. If you can look at the law and not feel like a sinner, you're either not really looking at the law or you're not really looking at yourself. But what Jesus wants then is you to look at the cross and say it's finished. And, and for Luther, that's exactly the place that he is with, with the small called articles. He's, he's five, seven years removed from Augsburg Confession, all hope of actually reforming and having, and he'll talk about this too. He's, he says, you know, the, the Pope was supposed to call a true Christian council. I wish we could have a true Christian council that we could sit together and discuss these things uh, these matters of divine and, 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 and serious importance for our salvation. He's like, but you know what? The last six years have proved otherwise. That's not going to happen. And he was right. 
Um, it, it, it lasts forever. It drags on forever. There's no councils that are ever called. Uh, the Lutherans never know if they're actually going to be able to go to the council and present their, their theology and their doctrine. If they do show up, are they immediately going to be arrested and then burned at the stake as heretics? Are they even going to get that chance, or are they going to be found in the middle of the night and drug out of their homes and thrown into prison when nobody sees it? I mean, these are all real things that Luther's dealing with, and he's sure he's going to die, and he says, you know what? It's, it's time to actually just lay this all out on the line. Well, and it, it's, it's more so, too, because he's not even just sort of worried about the right now, but he's actually starting to worry about his legacy. Um, and and not, not that it would be his legacy, but that he has one. And see, everybody actually wants people to listen to them when they think they have something to say and they think they can help. And then it's terrifying when people actually start to listen to you. Right. Because then you need to not mess up. Right. Luther doesn't want it. He just realizes that because of history and the way that it's happened, he does, he will have have a legacy that lasts after him. And if that's the case, then what is said about him once he's dead and gone, he needs and wants to make sure that they're saying the right things about him and that he's always been proclaiming the truth of the gospel. Right, and we do this too. Like if, if it's given by a certain name, we give it a pass regardless of what it is. Like you've got that friend who can say things that if you heard anywhere else, that's not okay. But because you know them and you trust them, all of a sudden, now we can smile and laugh about it. But it's, yeah, it's you. Um, <laughs> um, it's you, my friend. Um, but, but Luther recognizes that the things that, that get attached to his name, people will take as truth on one side and people will take as evil on the other. And so he says, I want to make sure that everybody going forward knows what we believe. We believe the scriptures. So he's going to lay it out piece by piece as we start to talk about the small called articles. It's going to be in um, three parts. And the first part is actually the really nice part because it's the part that we can actually agree on. And it's, it's a good with, reminder. With, with Rome. Yes, yeah. with, with everyone that, that would call themselves a Christian. Well, and, not with everybody who would call themselves a Christian. Th with everybody that God would call a Christian. There How about that? Okay. Because that's, you're right, that's a fair point. Because like, th there are people who would call themselves Christians but don't believe Jesus is God. Right, or That's don't believe in the triune God. That's right. a bad thing. Exactly. Um, and, and so maybe we'll, the, the second part is, is um, the, the stuff that nobody should rightly be able to contest, uh, that we can plain, plainly see in the scriptures. But and they then, do. But they do. And so Luther will tell them why they're wrong. And then the third is uh, the, the, the really getting down in the weeds and the really fun part. But the first part is actually really, really nice because the first part of the small cult articles is basically the creed. Like he says, if you right. want to know what we believe, let's, let's start here. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, sit to the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body. Do one of these right here, life everlasting. And now Amen. the Athanasian Creed. No. Nope. Uh, <laughs> But he does put that down here, too. He does, and right. he references it. But he, this is the point of the creed, though. So when we say this in church, it's not just because we need to fill some time and make sure that this absolutely needs to stretch to an hour, because I know we're hungry. Uh, when we say this, this is actually the answer to who is your God, which on the surface sounds like a really simple question. But if somebody just walks up to you and says, OK, who is God? Like, uh, Jesus, and like, I don't know what to say. You, you actually know who your God is. You've memorized the answer. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. You have not memorized the Athanasian Creed either, so don't look at me that way. Um, <laughs> but these three creeds, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and the Athanasian Creed, they're kind of where we draw the lines around Christendom, right? Right. This is, this is what it means to be a Christian. I mean, goodness, that's what, uh, especially the Athanasian Creed will actually say that, I believe, right. two different times, right? If you desire to be known as a Christian, you to must be believe. Saved. saved, right. You must believe thus about the Trinity and thus about Jesus. This is, this is what the church Catholic small c has believed from eternity. And so Luther starts off by saying, hey, this is what, we're in agreement, Rome, right? We, we, we've been in agreement since the Augsburg Confession. You look at the Augsburg Confession as well, um, and, and uh, the first couple articles, we're all sitting there going, yep, right? We're all, we're all there, we're all on the same page. Rome doesn't come back with any problems with it. And this is a good way for us to start. It's a good way for us to, to say, okay, no, yes, we've got differences. 
The differences are important. Let's make sure we talk about the important differences and not the unimportant differences. Luther, I think I mentioned that earlier too, but Luther does make that distinction where he's talking, it's, it's near the end of his preface here, and he says, there's tons of political things that we could talk about, tons of things that we could get lost in the weeds about. Uh, we don't have time for that, and that's not important. If we can figure out this uh, justification stuff, if we can forgive, forget, uh, sorry, figure out this gospel stuff, and then we still got time, fine, let's talk about the other stuff. He says, uh, as long as we want to swallow camels and strain at gnats, ignore the logs and judge the specks. Uh, he says we argue about stupid stuff. Um, we, we really do. We get so lost in whether or not the right hand was over the left hand, the right thumb was over the left thumb, uh, where, what, did you wear your alb or your cassock? And your, we, we argue about stupid stuff. And he says, you're missing the point. All of these should point to the gospel. It's not that they don't matter, but if you forget that they point to the gospel, Christ crucified and raised for sinners, for you, for me, it doesn't matter. Right. Because the devil can fold the right thumb over the left thumb and wear the cassock and the surplus and chant in the right note and not just one that he picked. Thank you. You think you're better than me. Uh, but that doesn't save <laughs> Christ who is risen from the dead does. Right. It's, it's a joy to actually have this because that means that I can actually say that there will be people in heaven who are not Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. <gasps> and see, this is, this is one of those things, though, where like we, we just get so used to being on our own that we think we close off heaven from other people. Um, this is, this is the creed. This is how we, we do it. We can say, you're making life really hard on yourself. If you want to put all of the impotence of your hope on your actions and not your baptism, we can say, if you really think that you can buy grandma out of an imaginary place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth when Jesus has already called her at his side, you're making life harder on yourself. But at the end of the day, we'll see you up there and, and you'll be very, very happy that you got to skip that whole purgatory thing. Uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, Luther's, Luther's whole point Again, and I think it's always been that, uh, is God desires to, uh, he desires to call the sinner to repentance, and then he desires to comfort the terrified sinner with Jesus and Christ crucified. Um, and so, yes, we understand the, the first part of this uh, small cult article, triune God, we believe in the same thing. Now let's move forward. Now let's move forward, unless you didn't want to, now let's move forward to the most important chief article, the thing that... What, the church falls on? I, I may be jumping ahead. No, we that's fine. Because like, this, is, this is the starting point. Like, Look, we, we're supposed to be on the same team, and we're supposed to read from the same book, so let's maybe do this. Uh, into the second part, he talks about this as the chief article. Uh, and this, it's this. Jesus Christ, our God and Lord, died for our sins and was raised again for our justification. He alone is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And God has laid upon him the iniquities of us all. Those are Bible verses. Those are all Bible verses. The thing we believe in is the Bible. It's not new. It's not made up. It's Jesus for sinners. And that means that it can be Jesus for you. That means that it can even be Jesus for me. This is the doctrine upon which everything that we teach depends upon. Right. And it, and it hasn't changed in, in seven years. You go back to the Augsburg Confession. I'll read the Augsburg Confessions. Uh, it's Article 4. It's the one that everybody talks about. If you ever hear AC4, Right. Uh, this is the one. This is the article that uh, that the church stands or falls upon. But you'll notice it hasn't changed. It's the same thing that Luther says in the small called articles. It's going to be the same thing that's said in the formula of Concord 60, 70 years later as well. And everybody makes sure to say that in these in these uh, um, in these writings here. So uh, Article four, Augsburg Confession, justification. Our churches teach that people cannot be justified before God by their own strength, merits, or works. People are freely justified for Christ's sake through faith when they believe that they are received into favor and that their sins are forgiven for the sake of Christ. By his death, Christ made satisfaction for our sins. God counts this faith for righteousness in his sight. Boom. Same thing. If you take this away, we lose everything. Like, you, you have to understand how important this is. If you take this one thing, Jesus died for sinners, for you, for me, away. Everything that we do should be burned. Everything that we do is a waste of time. Everything that we do is for naught. Because of all the, the time, and it's, it's actually, we're, we're doing a live episode. It's at a conference. We got to sing hymns, like, together. And we missed this last year. Uh, we're, we're doing this in a place where we, we feel like we're maybe not quite so alone. Because now there's not four kids from my youth group. But I actually realize that there's other people who believe this thing, too. Now we actually get to be around people who are struggling with the same struggles that we have. And actually find hope together. 
But if we take away dead Jesus and risen again Jesus, it should all burn. There are better things to do. Right. But that also means that all of the stuff that we talk about is going to circle this. Like if you want to know why Lutherans are the way that we are, why we're the mean church, it's because if Jesus is going to rest on me, I'm going to hell. Like I can't, I can't. I'm a dumpster fire. If Jesus died and rose though, all of the things that give me Jesus are very, very good. And this is it. This is everything. All of the other stuff either gives Jesus or points to Jesus. This is it. Right. And this is, this is one of those places where we're actually going to start to see why we forked, split away from the Roman Catholic Church. Right. They, they have a different thing upon which their church stands or falls. Right, right. And, and perhaps in our own conversations uh, with people as well, um, if we're doing this privately, because again, the way in which we're going to speak to our neighbor uh, in our backyard is going to be different than Luther speaking to the Pope right now. Um, and it's going to be different than the way that Melanchthon, there's going to be a, a small little uh, appendix at the end of the small called articles called the, the Power and Primacy in the, of the Pope. And he's, uh, uh, Melanchthon writes that, another one of the reformers, that he's not very uh, kind uh, to the Pope or the office of the papacy. Um, we are not going to talk that way to, the, uh, to our neighbors across the, uh, across the fence, which is fine. Um, but in the end, it's you how it should be. You talk to me that way. I talk to you that way. Right. But that's different. Uh, Why? You should know better. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but no, when we're going to uh, uh, talk about the things mm -hmm. of the church, and I think it's getting even more and more uh, prevalent in our own societies, you kids could probably recognize it even more than... Uh, us pastors, because we uh, go to church and spend our whole time in an office in a church building, and the things that we see are church-growing people. Uh, you kids are going to public high schools. You kids are having you friends that are... You don't got sinners in your church? Well, what I mean is... You of course trade? I do. Okay. No, of course I do. But, but what I mean is you're going to be having more conversations with, with uh, people, or you might, more prevalent conversations with people uh, that, that don't understand a thing. Well, or, or maybe different denominations. And so let's actually talk I, about the main thing that matters. I think this is actually a pretty unanimous thing. When you walk out there and people say, you're a Christian, you must be, what do they fill in the blank with? That's what this is about. What is a Christian? What makes a Christian? Is it somebody who's well-behaved and doesn't say bad words? Is it somebody who always has courage and never ever doubts and just cannot wait to knock on doors and talk to strangers about the love, love, love they have in their heart for Jesus? Or is it a poor, miserable sinner who gets drug along every day by their life, by a God who is merciful and every day makes new, every day makes holy? This is, this is actually the thing that I think matters now more than ever. Because everything that we teach and practice depends on this, that God is merciful to hypocrites. See, it's not, it's not good to be a hypocrite. A hypocrite is somebody who believes in something bigger than themselves, right? Well, for some reason, everybody expects Christians to not be hypocrites, which means you must be every bit as great as the God you believe in. The problem that means is that your God sucks. Like, if you can perfectly embody your God, your God really sucks. You should get a much better God than that. If you can perfectly live up to your God's standards, he's really, really slumming it. However, if you believe in a God who's actually bigger than yourself, it's a bad thing that I cannot fulfill the law. But it's a really, really good thing I have a God who's bigger than me who did it for me. It's a really, really good thing I have a God who's bigger than me, who I can depend on to actually help me with all the other stuff that's bigger than me too. Right. A Christian <clears throat> is defined by this. Jesus died for sinners, for me, for you. And when you put it on anything else, the hypocrisy doesn't just show up. The law shows up for us too. But it's that we have nothing to do with that. We have no place to put that hypocrisy. Here we say it's very simple. You take all the things that you should not have done but did and all the things you should have done but did not do. The, I'm a snake, poor, miserable sinner. Right. You've ruined this. Uh, but we heap that all upon the cross. And we say, Lord, have mercy. And we rejoice in the fact that he does so that when we go out into the world, our identity is not found in us being good boys and girls. It's found in the mercy of Jesus. And then, so everything else that we, we talk about with this individual, where we've started this conversation, or maybe we screwed up and now we're going back and restarting this conversation, but everything else that we talk about in regards to our faith, uh, in regards to why we do what we do at church, Right? We don't start the conversation uh, with the worship wars. 
We don't start the conversation that way. We start the conversation in regards to the chief article and justification. And then everything else we talk about in regards to Jesus, dead and risen for you. Why do you, we do this this way? How does that tie back to Jesus? How does this, the way that we're doing it, better point to a dead Jesus on the cross for you and a risen Jesus from the grave for you? Do we have to pause again? It's because I can follow instructions like people pointing at me. He was um, supposed to clap. That was when we started. He was supposed to clap, right? That was when we started. We did clap. Thank you. Good. Thanks, other guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> but my, oh, you're gonna my talk no, more? well, my whole point was okay, it, it's, it's, we argue about things that matter. And we, we have to make sure that they're all based in this chief article. And if we can't actually, uh, if, if we find ourselves in a theological argument uh, with a friend of ours or a relative of ours, and we can't for the life of us bring it back to Jesus and his gospel for you, um, maybe we should stop with that argument. Just call it the truth. We're doing it wrong. Right. This was a simple thing when I was a, a, a baby pastor in there teaching me something how, how, when you have to go and talk. Uh, it can be very inspiring. It can be clever. It can be funny. It can be, it, it can be uplifting. It can be wholesome. But if Jesus didn't need to die on the cross and rise again from the dead, it wasn't a sermon. It, it, it wasn't. A sermon is dead Jesus for you. And in the same way, the things that we do in church, they can't just talk about Jesus. That's, that's like going to a restaurant and then expecting the waitress to just talk about the hamburger and never bring you one. That's a garbage restaurant. You shouldn't go there. <laughs> we go because this is where Jesus has promised to be. Everything that we do in church, it ties to this. This is where God gives you the gifts. This is where Jesus, who died on the cross, is brought forward through time and space and delivered to you. Right. Your baptism gives you Jesus. The word gives you Jesus. The absolution gives you Jesus. The supper gives you Jesus. It's, it's very repetitive, but at the same time, that's good because over and over again, I need me some Jesus. Right. And so with Luther here, we've, we've got the first part. We talked about that. We've got the beginning of the second part, right? So the, the first article of the second part. And this chief article, it, it should be, and, and I don't know, I, Rome probably would have had a problem hearing this uh, for some reason or another back then, probably still does now, officially. But your Roman Catholic friend may not. Like, if you actually say this, these words, and it is good, right. Your Roman Catholic friend may not have a problem if you just read this chief article to them, and they're like, yes, absolutely. And that's a great thing. Then we say, okay, wonderful. Now let's, now let's continue on. Let's talk about other things. Luther will actually do that. So on the off chance that, that the Roman uh, Catholic Church during that time would have taken a look at this uh, first article and said, okay, fine, we agree with this too. He says, okay, but now let's talk about, and we're not going to get into it today, but this is how he works. He says, okay, the chief article is Jesus for you, dead and risen, because you can't do it yourself. You're a poor, miserable sinner. Great. Thanks. Now let's talk about how the mass doesn't show that. And maybe that's how we kind of continue with our conversations with those around us as well. And it, not, not trying to point people out and calling them uh, horrible, uh, you horrible papist, right? <laughs> we don't want to do that. Uh, but certainly we want to say, okay, why is it that you guys do what you do? Why is it that you believe what you believe? What does this thing that you do in your church, whether it's Roman Catholic or non-denominational or just whomever who sits at home and believes in Jesus but doesn't need to go to church, why and how does that point to this chief article? Right, because this is connected. Like, this is not just sort of one part of your religion. This is the thing that ties into every other piece of it. Every other piece of what you do in church, what you do in, in, in your faith, it is tied and rooted solely in this justification. Jesus died for a sinner, and you're all right with God. You are holy, righteous, pure before God because he did all the work. He died after fulfilling the law and rose again from the dead. This is tied to all of it. And, and you're right, it should actually shape your practice because your practice should be informed by your belief. It's, it's simple. You do this everywhere else. If you believe that the stove is hot, what do you do? Do you touch the stove or do you not touch the stove? When I was five, uh -oh. my, we didn't have a hot air uh, uh, popcorn popper. Uh, my dad had to do it on the stove. It was an apartment building. We were poor. And uh, it was the coil rings, right? 
And uh, if anybody's seen coil rings on a stove from uh, 1980, when you turn them off, they immediately go from hot glowing red to black, which means that they're ice cold <laughs> right afterwards. And I'm sitting, standing on a chair as like a four-year-old. My dad's doing the stuff, and then he goes across the kitchen. I'm like, that's cold. And I put my whole hand on it. And then we go to the hospital. <laughs> And then I'm inter interrogated by a bunch of people for hours on end because they're convinced that no kid is dumb enough to put their whole hand <laughs> on a stove and my parents must be doing this as punishment. They weren't. They're good parents. They're great parents. I feel like you have some baggage we need to unpack later. <laughs> no. Nope, I'm good. Okay, everything's good? I'm, I'm good now. Okay, so um, barring four-year-old Pastor Lietzow, uh, if you believe the stove is hot, you don't put your hand on it. The, what you believe informs the practice. And, and so, like, also with me, I, I watched the movie Jaws in the 80s, and so I was afraid there was a shark in the swimming pool, even though it was clear and I could see to the bottom. And so I climbed out just as fast as I could every single time. Uh, what you believe informs how you act. Do you talk the same way when your parents are in the room or when they're not? If you believe they can hear you, it's different. Um, we, we try to be appropriate. Uh, and so, um, if you actually believe that Jesus is risen from the dead, that's usually enough to change your worldview a little bit. If you believe that he is present in the bread and the wine, maybe we'll treat it a little bit differently. What we believe shapes how we do everything else. And so when we start to talk about what our church looks like, what we believe, how we can define ourselves as Christians, it is always and all going to fall upon this. Uh, Luther says, otherwise all is lost. And the Pope, the devil, and all adversaries win the victory and the right over us. We hang on to justification for all we are worth. Jesus for sinners, Jesus for you. Right? What time is it? We good? I'm okay we're with this We're right episode. there? We're good? Good. All right. The, good, the good news is... Um, podcast over? You, podcast over. You don't have to actually wait for anything else. You don't have to go see the first three seasons because we don't say anything else. We, we just, just keep say talking Jesus. About Jesus. <laughs> so you've heard it once. You've heard it however many times we've said it. But I need it every week, every I do day. Too. Yep, absolutely. All right, so we out. 